بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبروا آياته وليتذكروا الألباب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله خالق كل شيء وهو على كل شيء وكيل له مقاليد السماوات والأرض والذين كفروا بآيات الله أولئك هم الخاسرون قل أفغير الله تأمروني أعبد أيها الجاهلون ولقد أوحي إليك وإلى الذين من قبلك لئن أشركت ليحبطن عملك ولتكونن من الخاسرين بل الله فاعبد وكن من الشاكرين وما قدر الله حق قدره والأرض جميعا قبضته يوم القيامة والسماوات مطويات بيمينه سبحانه وتعالى عما يشركون ونفخ في الصور فصعق من في السماوات ومن في الأرض إلا من شاء الله ثم نفخ فيه أخرى فإذا هم قيام ينظرون وأشرقت الأرض بنور ربها ووضع الكتاب وجيء بالنبيين والشهداء وقضي بينهم بالحق وقضي بينهم بالحق وهم لا يظلمون ووفيت كل نفس ما عملت وهو أعلم بما يفعلون وسيق الذين كفروا إلى جهنم زمرا حتى إذا جاء فتحت أبوابها وقال لهم خزنتها وقال لهم خزنتها ألم يأتكم رسل منكم يتلون عليكم آيات ربكم وينذرونكم وينذرونكم لقاء هذا قالوا بلى ولكن حقت كلمة العذاب على الكافرين قيل ادخلوا أبواب جهنم خالدين فيها فبئس مثوى المتكبرين وسيق الذين اتقوا ربهم إلى الجنة زمرا حتى إذا جاءوها وفتحت أبوابها وقال لهم خزنتها وقال لهم خزنتها سلام عليكم طبتم فادخلوها خالدين وقالوا الحمد لله الذي صدقنا وعده وأورثنا الأرض نتبوأ من الجنة حيث نشاء 
فنعم أجر العاملين وترى الملائكة حافين من حول العرش يسبحون بحمد ربهم وقضي بينهم بالحق وقيل الحمد لله رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حميم تنزيل الكتاب من الله العزيز العليم غافر الذنب وقابل التوب شديد العقاب ذي الطول لا إله إلا هو إليه المصير ما يجادل في آيات الله إلا الذين كفروا فلا يغرك تقلبهم في البلاد كذبت قبلهم قوم نوح والأحزاب من بعدهم وهمت كل أمة برسولهم ليأخذوه وجادلوا بالباطل ليدحضوا به الحق فأخذتهم فكيف كان عقاب وكذلك حقت كلمة ربك على الذين كفروا أنهم أصحاب النار الذين يحملون العرش ومن حوله يسبحون بحمد ربهم ويؤمنون به ويستغفرون للذين آمنوا ويستغفرون للذين آمنوا ربنا وسعت كل شيء رحمة وعلما فاغفر للذين تابوا واتبعوا سبيلك وقهم عذاب الجحيم ربنا وأدخلهم جنات عدن التي وعدتهم ومن صلح من آبائهم وأزواجهم وذرياتهم إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم وقهم السيئات ومن تق السيئات يومئذ فقد رحمته وذلك هو الفوز العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون نحن أولياؤكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ولكم فيها ما تشتهي أنفسكم ولكم فيها ما تدعون نزلا من غفور رحيم ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين 
ولا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة ادفع بالتي هي أحسن فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه ولي حميم وما يلقاها إلا الذين صبروا وما يلقاها إلا ذو حظ عظيم وإما ينزغنك من الشيطان نزغ فاستعذ بالله إنه هو السميع العليم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We begin by praising Allah who showed all of us the straight path, the guided way. He created the heavens and earth with wisdom and purpose in neither jest nor play. He beautified the heavens with stars and celestial objects and to keep the shayateen at bay. And he made the earth varied with lush vegetations and flowing streams and all types of dazzling display. He created us from a mixture of fluids after having created our father from pure clay. It is in His remembrance that our fears are resolved and our worries lifted and our dismay. We ask Him for guidance and forgiveness and seek refuge in Him from being led astray. Today, inshaAllah ta'ala, we're going to be doing three surahs, uh, beginning with Surah Az-Zumur. And all of these surahs are Makki surahs. Surah Az-Zumur, is around nine pages long, it's uh, less than half a juz, and 75 verses. And it is one of the uh, mid to mid late Makki surahs. And it is named Zumur, and Zumur means throngs of people, large groups of people all coming together. And it is named because at the very end of the surah, it is one of the most iconic passages in the Quran that describes people being gathered together, both towards heaven and hell, and entering it in Zumur, or in throngs. And that's why the surah is called the surah Az-Zumur. And according to some reports, our Prophet ﷺ would recite this surah regularly. Uh, some reports even say every single night. And the main theme of the surah is devoted to indicating that religion, all of it belongs to Allah sincerely. We need to be worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely. And those who do so are praised. And those who do not do so, they are criticized. And of course, the other Meccan themes are also in this surah. Also, Surah Az-Zumur contains in it the verse that a large group of commentators, even some of the tabi'un, the early scholars of Islam, they commented that the, this verse in Surah Az-Zumur that we're going to come to, it is the single most optimistic verse in the entire Quran. And we're going to come to it inshallah ta'ala today. And the surah begins with stating its theme very clearly. Verse number three. Ala lillah al-deen al-khalis that verily the deen or the religion belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone all religion all religiosity it belongs to Allah alone and as for those who take guardians besides him uh, Surah Az-Zumar gives us an excuse. They say, we're only worshiping them so that they may bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, this is the psychology of all those who worship other gods or other entities. They say, we want to go through them to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you see, Allah is not like the other gods of the false uh, religions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accessible to all of us. He hears our prayers. He knows who we are. There is no need to go through an intermediate no one is more merciful than Ar-Rahman. No one is more powerful than Al-Qawi. No one is more knowledgeable than Al-Sami' and Al-Alim. So there is no need to go through any other entity. And to go through those entities is to create partners along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, this is the crux of our religion. Really, we can truly say as Muslims that no other faith takes monotheism so seriously as we do. No other faith is as crystal clear in its understanding of Tawheed of La ilaha illallah as we are. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this surah as well, again, one of the main theological aspects of how powerful he is. Verse number seven, in takfuru fa inna Allah ghaniyun ankum. If you decide to commit kufr, if you want to disbelieve, Allah has no need of you. Wa in tashkuru yardahu lakum. And if you are thankful and 
believe, then he shall be pleased with you. وَلَا يَرْضَى لِعِبَادِهِ الْكُفْرِ That Allah is not pleased with his servants choosing a kufr or fisq and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that to him you shall return and then he shall inform you of what you used to do. So once again the point here is that if we choose to believe or disbelieve we do not benefit or hurt a'udhu billah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we're only benefiting ourselves if we choose to believe or harming ourselves. And again verse number 11 and 12 all of these are about the sincerity to Allah alone. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أُمِرْتُ وَنْعَبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْرَصَ اللَّهُ الدِّينَ Say, I have been commanded to worship Allah with ikhlas. The religion belongs only to Him. How many times in the surah, especially in the whole Quran, we're talking about all aspects of religion, all aspects of devotion, all rituals, all of it should be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, the opposite are those who turn to other than Allah. And Allah describes their miserable state in verse 15. قُلْ إِنَّ الْخَاسِرِينَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَهْلِيهِمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامِ that truly the uh, ones who have utterly lost, the losers literally, are those who have lost themselves and their families on the day of judgment. That is indeed the obvious or the greatest loss. Not only were they themselves failures, they weren't even positive role models for their loved ones. And we definitely don't want to be amongst uh, them. Also in this surah, we have a standard motif that is again in many, many surahs, and that is that when a person is in pain, when a person is struggling, when a person is in trouble, they constantly call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and this is actually twice in Surah Al-Zumur. Contrast verse 8 and verse 49, that the first half is exactly the same, and the second half is slightly different. As for verse 8, Allah criticizes that, and again, as I said before, Allah never criticizes turning to Him when you need Him. Uh, Allah only criticizes uh, re neglecting or rejecting or worshipping other than him after uh, the blessings have been given. So in verse 8, Allah criticizes one segment and that is once they get what they want, once the calamity is lifted, they turn to other than Allah. That is one criticism. The second criticism, verse 49, is that when the person has the calamity lifted, instead of thanking Allah, he says, oh, this is because of myself. I knew what to do. I went to the right person. I got the right help. And they don't realize that everything happens by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to be very careful uh, of ever thinking that we got out of a calamity because is something that we have done. It is Allah Azza wa Jal who saves. And Allah says in verse 49, بَلْ هِيَ fitna. This being saved from a calamity was itself a test and a calamity. To see how you would react. The very principle of being saved. How did you react when the blessing came? Allah is saying that blessing, بَلْ هِيَ fitna. It is a trial in and of itself. How do you respond to it? So never take credit for having saved yourself from any situation. It is Allah who saved you but from mechanisms and means that maybe you saw, but those mechanisms came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah praises those who turn to Him and praises those who listen to the Qur'an and follow it. Verse number 18, that the righteous are those who they listen to the qawl, the words of Allah, and then they follow the best of it. فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَهُ They follow the best of it, or they follow to the best of their uh, capability. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ هَدَاهُمُ اللَّهِ These are the ones whom Allah has guided. وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ أُلُوا الْأَلْبَابِ And these are the people who are truly intelligent. And also verse number 9, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala contrasts those who reject versus those who are righteous. And Allah says, أَمَّنْ هُوَ قَانِتٌ آنَاءَ اللَّيْلِ سَاجِدًا وَقَائِمًا That is the person who rejects the same as the one who is worshipping devoutly, standing during the watches of the night, prostrating uh, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mindful of the hereafter and placing his hopes in the mercy of Allah. قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Say, do those who know, are they the same as those who are ignorant? Only people of knowledge and people of intellect will understand. Notice both of these verses, Allah says, أُلُوا الْأَلْبَابِ are the ones who are doing good. And أُلُوا الْأَلْبَابِ here are the people who are intelligent enough 
to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The real intelligence that the Quran praises, there are many types of intelligence. Nobody's denying that a type of intelligence can be manifested in every single field. You have intelligence that is manifested in agriculture, in engineering, in mathematics, in chemistry, and physics. That's a type of intelligence that's absolutely great. But the ultimate intelligence, which is far more precious and useful than any other type, in fact, all of them combined, is the intelligence of recognizing your Creator and the intelligence of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who knows how to get to the moon and back, but hasn't discovered his own purpose in life, is truly not intelligent. The one who can solve the most abstract equations, but doesn't know who created the universe, that person's intelligence has failed him or her. And the Muslim uh, who doesn't maybe know all of this fancy stuff or whatnot, but he knows why he's here. He knows who created him, and he knows what's gonna happen after that, meaning he's gonna go back to Allah and prepares for that day. That is the very, the most intelligent person. That is the one, as Allah says, أُولَئِكَ هُمْ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ These are the real people of intelligence. So do not be deluded, dear Muslims, by those who might have an intelligence in some facet of this world, but they don't understand the purpose of this world. Real intelligence is to understand why you are here and to make the best of that. And in order to do that, you don't need to have abstract knowledge of very difficult sciences and complex. That's a different type of thing. And Allah praises ulul albab multiple times in this surah and in other surahs as well. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that the righteous are those who follow it to the best. They try their best. فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَهُ One interpretation of أَحْسَنَهُ is they follow it to the best that they can do it. And so Allah Azza wa Jal is only asking to see your best effort and that is going to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah praises those people in this surah who choose to worship Him. Verse number 20, لَكِنِ الَّذِينَ تَقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ But for, as for those who truly had piety and had taqwa, لَهُمْ غُرَفٌ مِنْ فَوْقِهَا غُرَفٌ مَبْنِيَّةٌ They're going to have palaces and mansions on top of them as well are palaces and, man and mansions built high up with streams flowing between them. This is the promise of Allah and Allah never breaks His promise. This is the ghuraf and our Prophet ﷺ said that the ghuraf are the higher chambers of Jannah. Jannah is not one of one level. There are many, many levels of Jannah and the ghuraf are the higher levels. And Allah Azzawajal is saying, those that have genuine taqwa, they will be given multiple ghuraf, multiple chambers and palaces. And of course, we need to think long and hard, what level do we want in Jannah? And how hard should we, we, we be working to get to those uh, levels? Also, we have over here in verse number 22, Again, a very uh, common motif of the Quran that afaman huwa, uh, uh, that uh, can you compare the one who is misguided? Afaman sharah Allah, excuse me. Afaman sharah Allah sadrahu lil Islami, fa huwa ala nurim min Rabbi, fa waylu lil qasiyati qulubuhum min dhikri Allah. Ulaika fi dalal mubin. That um, the one who has his chest opened for the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَفَمَنْ شَرَحَ اللَّهُ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ Give the example of the one whose heart has been opened up to Islam. And so he has a light from Allah. So woe to those whose hearts have become hard from against the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at verse number 22 and extract from it three motifs that run throughout the entire Quran. Three beautiful mechanisms by which Allah Azza wa Jal demonstrates truth from guidance. Number one, the motif of the chest being opened up. Now in Arabic, opening the chest, we call it in, in English, uh, the ease of the chest or the comfort of the chest or the coolness if you like. So in Arabic, the fact that the, the expression sharah as sadr, it means the comfort of the soul. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, the true comfort of the soul comes from Islam. And this is a common motif. There's at least four or five verses in the whole Quran that talk about the chest being comforted by Islam. The second motif is that, is that guidance, oh, and of course the opposite by the way, so if the chest being opened up is a signification of Islam, then the Quran also has the chest being tightened as that 
person who doesn't have Islam. And Allah mentions this in multiple verses, uh, that the one who does not worship him, his chest is constrained, his chest feels tight. And the meaning here is like the one whose chest is literally tight, they cannot breathe with ease, and so they don't find uh, comfort. And so this is one motif, that Islam leads to the comfort of the chest, and a lack of Islam leads to a problem of the chest, meaning narrow constrictedness. The second motif is the motif of light versus darkness. And this is very common, over two dozen verses in the Quran about light versus darkness, that the one who is guided has a light. The one who is guided becomes a light. The one who is guided is blessed with a light. Noorun ala noor, yahdi Allahu li noorihi man yasha, yukhrijuhum min al-dhurumati ila noor, right? Wa anzalna ilikum nooran mubina. Over and over again, you can quote so many verses about the motif of light. Allah Himself is light. His book is light. His prophet is light. He guides to light. He takes people from darkness to light. And of course, the opposite, that those who turn away from Allah, they are uh, 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 the example of the one wandering in the darkness. And again, what a beautiful motif, because what does light do? Light, it situates you, it shows you who you are, where you are, it tells you where you're going and how to get there. So too is Islam, it is a light. You see where you are, you know who you are, you can see the destination, that's Jannah, and you know how to get there. And there's no problems because the light is around you. And the one who doesn't have Islam, wandering aimlessly in the dark, having no point, no, no, there's no point. I mean, imagine being in pitch darkness, you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going, even if you know where you're going, you couldn't find your way there, even if you knew roughly where to go, you wouldn't know what is on the way, impediments or problems or falling or traps. So this is the motif of, of light versus darkness. And then the third motif, which is around half a dozen verses in the Quran, the third motif is that of soft heart versus hard heart. The heart being soft, the heart being pure, and the heart being hard. The qaswatul qalb. This is the opposite, and uh, the 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 the, um, uh, the motif of the heart being uh, pure and clean, and the heart being soft, and the heart being uh, um, trembling from the fear of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So Allah Azza wa Jal praises those whose hearts are soft. And the point of the heart being soft is, of course, very clear, and that is the one who humble and gentle, and the hard-hearted is the one who is unsympathetic, cruel, the one who doesn't really care about anything except himself. So this beautiful verse, by the way, so the point here, verse number 22, it combines all three of these motifs uh, all into one verse, and that's very rare in the Quran, and uh, it's something that is very beautiful in this verse over here. Uh, and of course, Allah then mentions that how does one get the soft heart? How does one become guided to the light? Verse number 23, that Allah Allah has sent down the best of all scriptures, the best of all speech. This, this is the Quran. The Quran is the best speech, and Allah calls it Ahsan al Hadithi Kitaban Mutashabiha. A scripture here, Mutashabih, does not mean ambiguous. Mutashabih means that it is perfect in its consistency, that each part of it is affirming other parts. Mathaniya, Allah calls the entire Quran Mathani. Interesting, uh, last week or two weeks ago, we talked about Surah Al-Fatiha being called Sab al Mathani, the seven that are oft repeated. Now here, Allah says the Quran is Mathani. And this is very interesting, because again, if you look at the global religions and you look at the scriptures of the world, there is no scripture on the face of this earth. There is no textbook that is considered holy. There is no uh, book that is considered to be the main book of a faith tradition that is memorized in its totality and that is recited on a daily basis multiple times the way that the Quran is recited. And again, this is a beautiful prediction and a factual statement. This is a kitab that is mathani. It is frequently recited. In this month, the Quran is being recited billions and billions of times across the globe. There is no scripture on earth that is deemed holy by its inhabitants by its adherence that is recited even a fraction of the time that the Quran is recited. And then Allah says, minhu rabbahum. The skins of those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they tremble in fear. And then their hearts and their skins become soft to the remembrance of Allah. This is indeed the guidance of Allah. He guides whom He wills. This verse is again an important indication of another Islamic point of theology, fear and hope. 
to be combined at the same time. This verse combines it along with many other verses. You have to simultaneously be fearful of Allah and love and hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of this is combined at once. If you don't have these emotions all together, this is gonna lead to a problem. If a person is only just, oh, Allah will forgive, no big deal, Allah is ghafoor. You know, Allah is ghafoor, but there should always also be, but what if he punishes? There should always be that element of fear as well. And this verse combines the two. You need to be fearful of Allah's punishment, even as you're hopeful in His mercy. And that combination is where Iman uh, comes. Contrast this with verse 46, that when, uh, Allah describes those who reject Allah, that uh, when Allah alone is mentioned, the hearts of those who do not believe in Allah, they shrink in anger and resentment. And when uh, those that are besides Allah, their false gods are mentioned, they become filled of joy. So Allah describes the believers who when Allah is mentioned, when the Quran is recited, they become happy and they become scared of Allah's punishment. Contrast this with those who have rejected Allah, that when Allah is mentioned alone, without the gods, the false gods, they're like, nah, we don't, we don't want to worship God alone. And when the other gods are mentioned, they become happy. And of course, uh, inshallah ta'ala, you know, uh, paganism has been eliminated from the Muslim ummah, alhamdulillah. At the same time, we all always need to be monitoring of our hearts that what really makes us happy when we think about it, what makes us, what brings us joy, even though it's not to the same level. But if things besides Allah's Quran and Allah's dhikr, if things make us that happy, and when Allah is mentioned, religion is mentioned, religiosity is mentioned, when we don't feel happy, there is clearly a problem, and we need to think about that as well. Uh, this surah as well, by the way, has one of the key verses that teaches us another interesting facet about our lives, and that is that sleep is the twin half and the twin brother of death. And it is mentioned here in verse number uh, 42. That Allah says, Allah That Allah takes the souls of the people who die, and Allah takes the souls of those who do not die when they go to sleep. And so when you go to sleep, what is sleep? And to this day, by the way, we don't know what sleep is, and we don't quite understand the reality of sleep. How can scientists explain to us the reality of sleep when sleep is something that is spiritual in nature, in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes our arwah, He takes our ruh away from us, and so we are still alive, and yet not quite alive in the full life sense. And so sleep, uh, in one hadith, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, sleep is the brother of death. And that's why there will not be sleeping in Jannah because we don't are not gonna die. And sleep is the brother of death. We will never sleep in Jannah because we're never gonna get tired in Jannah. We need to sleep in this world, but in the Akhirah, there is no uh, sleeping. And so Allah is saying that this blessing of sleep, I am the one who allows you and I take your souls every single night you go. And that's why when our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would go to sleep and then wake up, he would say, Alhamdulillah ladhi ahyana ba'da ma amatana. All praise is due to Allah who has given me life after he has caused me to die and to him we shall return. The surah concludes with a very powerful section, it's an iconic section uh, recited again very uh, frequently in the salawat uh, by the Qurra. And uh, it begins with the, this conclusion, it's a rather long conclusion. It begins with verse 53. And it is this verse 53 that is almost universally considered to be the most optimistic verse in the entire Quran. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ Say, O oh my servants who have transgressed against your own selves, never give up hope of the mercy of Allah. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Allah forgives all sins. Indeed, Allah is the ghafoor and the rahim. So in this verse, Allah is saying, don't even give up hope that always be hopeful that Allah shall forgive all of your sins. Allah is indeed the Ghafoor and the Rahim. And then Allah says, how do you do that? Verse 54, turn to Allah Azza wa Jal and submit to Him before the uh, punishment comes. And then verse 55, follow the best of what has been revealed to you. In other words, do your best to follow what you know to be the truth before once again the regret uh, comes and you begin regretting, if I get another chance, let me go back. Don't do that, follow the best right now. And then Allah says in verse 64, 
that tell those who reject Islam, tell those who reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, قُلْ أَغَيْرَ اللَّهِ تَأْمُرُونِّي أَعْبُدُ أَيُّهَا الْجَاهِلُونَ Oh you fools, do you want me to worship other than Allah? Is that what you're calling me to do? Indeed, Allah says, whoever worships other than Him, all of their good deeds will be in vain, and they will be of the losers of the hereafter. And then the surah finishes off talking about a beautiful uh, scene from the Day of Judgment, terrifying scene, the trumpets will be blown, and everyone on the heavens and earth will fall down in a stupor, in an almost death, and then it will be sounded again, and everyone will be resurrected. And the earth will shine with the light of its Lord, and the book will be placed, and the prophets and the witnesses will be brought out, and judgment will be passed upon them with justice, and none shall be shown any wrong. And every single soul will be given what it has done, for indeed Allah is aware of all that they have done. And then verse 71 mentions, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَىٰ جَهَنَّمَ زُمَرًا Those who did kufr, they shall be driven to hell in throngs. And then when they reach it, the doors open up and the keepers say to them, how did you end up here? Didn't prophets come to you? Didn't books come to you? And they don't really have an excuse. And so they will be said, enter Jahannam and you're going to be in there forever. And what an evil destination it is for those who are arrogant. And then verse 73, as for those who feared Allah and were conscious of Allah, they too will be led to paradise in throngs until when they have reached it and its gates open. And of course, if you read the Arabic, there's an and over here, whereas in Jahannam, there is no and. And this is a very subtle indication of excitement in the behalf of the people of Jannah and terror in behalf of the people of Jahannam. They're gonna be dragged to Jahannam, the gates are gonna be open. And the righteous people, and they will be going to Jannah, and then the gates will open up. So just that one wow, it is an indication of excitement that there's an anticipation for the people of Jannah. And then there is terror for the people of uh, Jannah. And so the gates of Jannah will then open up and the angels will say, Salamun alaykum. Peace be unto you. How beautiful of this abode it is. Enter into it to dwell therein forever. And they will thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as they're thanking Allah, and they will look up and they will see, And you will see the angels hovering and flying around the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, glorifying Allah, praising Allah. And it will be said to them, the final conclusion of the surah, وَقِيلَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ this is going to be the chatter of Jannah and the background of Jannah. What will be the noises of Jannah? It will be Alhamdulillah and Subhanallah and the dhikr. This is what is going to be said in this beautiful abode of paradise. So the ending of Surah Al-Zumr talks about the angels that are praising Allah around the throne. Then Surah Ghafir begins. And Surah Ghafir, is the first of seven surahs that all begin with Hamim. So this is an interesting fact, all Muslims should know this, that there are seven surahs that begin with Hamim. And Surah Ghafir is the first of those uh, surahs. And one by one, we're gonna be quickly doing all of these surahs uh, today and tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala. And all of these are Makki, and all of these have a similar uh, time frame. And so these are the seven Hawamim, the seven Hamim uh, surahs. And Surah Ghafir, is called Ghafir, by the way, in some uh, Mus'has it's also called Surah Mu'min. So this is one of the surahs that, uh, there's a number of surahs in the Quran that are that have different names in different cultures. And so uh, those people from uh, India, Pakistan, and the subcontinent, uh, their, their mushafs are printed surah mu'min. And then the uh, our brothers, uh, mainly from the Arab countries, uh, it, it's printed surah ghafir. And again, these names, as we said, they go back to the Sahaba and Tabi'un. And so some groups used to call it ghafir, others called it mu'min. And so to this day, uh, you have these differences that are present in the uh, Muslim world. And so uh, it is called Ghafir uh, because it begins with the name of Allah, Ghafir al-Dhanbi, that Allah is the forgiver of sins. And others call it Mu'min because it mentions the believer, uh, the Mu'min of Ali Fir'aun, the believer in the household of Fir'aun. And the primary theme of this surah is the perpetual battle between Iman and Kufr, between belief and disbelief, and the help 
that Allah gives to the believers and the fate of the tyrants and the rejectors. Now, we said Surah Zumur ended by talking about the angels around the throne of Allah, praising Allah. Surah Ghafir begins as if it left off from there and we hear another facet of the angels around the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the beginning of Surah Ghafir is one of my favorite beginnings of the Quran. Hamim, tanzilu kitab min Allah al-Aziz al-Alim, ghafir al-Dhanbi wa qabil al-Tawbi, shadid al-Iqab, the tawli la ilaha illa hu ilayhi al-Masir. And by the way, this surah is full of beautiful names and adjectives and descriptions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who forgives the sins. He is the one who accepts repentance. He is the one who is severe in punishment. He is the one who is bountiful in, 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 in giving. There is no God except Him. To Him is the ultimate return. And then in verse seven, we go back to the angels that Allah says, الَّذِينَ يَحْمِلُونَ الْعَرْشَ Those who carry the throne and those around it, they are constantly praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They believe in Allah. And what else do they do? وَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا They ask forgiveness for those who believe. And they pray to Allah that, O oh Allah, you have encompassed everything in mercy. So forgive those who repent. Forgive those who are following your way and protect them from the fire of hell. O oh Allah, admit them into gardens of eternity that you have promised them and cause them and the righteous of their parents and their spouses and their children to be with them. For indeed, you are the Almighty and the all-wise. O oh Allah, protect them from all evil deeds. وَقِهِمُ السَّيِّئَاتِ Protect them from evil deeds. For indeed, whomever you have protected from evil deeds, on that day you shall have mercy. And indeed, that is the great achievement. SubhanAllah. What are the angels praying for? The angels are rooting for you. The angels want you to win. The angels want you to be forgiven. Not just any angels. The angels that are carrying the throne of Allah. The angels around the throne, the entire creation, the great, the best of the best, that's the angels. They want to see us win. And they're asking Allah to protect us. And they're asking Allah to forgive those who turn into repentance. They're asking Allah to make us righteous. So, O sinner, O sinner, what prevents you from repenting when the entire creation of Allah wants to see piety? When the greatest angels and the ones carrying the throne, they're constantly making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, anyone who repents, accept his repentance. Oh Allah, forgive the sinner when they come to you and ask for forgiveness. Oh Allah, cause that sinner and his family, the children, the spouse, the parents, all of them that are righteous, cause them to be together in Jannah. You have the greatest angels making dua for you. So what's preventing you, dear sinner, from turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the surah, as I said, it also mentions many beautiful names and attributes of Allah. Allah says in the Quran, verse number 14 of this surah, so call upon Allah with sincere devotion to Him, even if the disbelievers uh, resent it. رَفِيعُ الدَّرَجَاتِ ذُو الْعَرْشِ يُلْقِ الرُّوحَ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ لِيُنْذَرَ يَوْمَ التَّلَاقِ رَفِيعُ الدَّرَجَاتِ Allah is exalted in ranks. He is the owner of the throne. On that day, Allah says that uh, the day of judgment, nothing about them will be concealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then in verse 17, the famous verse, لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ Allah will ask, to whom does the kingdom belong today? And then having no one to answer, Allah will answer himself, لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَّارِ To Allah belongs the kingdom today, and the one, and the qahar is the one who conquers everything else. Allah describes himself in verse 19, as he knows the sly deception of the eye, and he knows what the hearts conceal. What is the sly deceptions of the eye? Allah Azza wa Jal knows when your eyes are sending signals and messages, when your eyes are looking at what they should not look. No one knows except you. When you look at something, what is the thoughts behind it? What is the perception? If you send a hidden message, or if you look at something you should not look at, Allah Azza wa Jal is saying this is the khain, or the deception, or the treachery of the eyes. And Allah knows what the hearts conceal. And Allah judges with with justice and those whom they call upon besides Allah, they cannot do any justice. Indeed, it is Allah who is the hearing and the seeing. The story then go, the surah then goes on to the main story, which is famous in this surah, only mentioned in the surah, and it is a relatively long story for the surah, verses 24 to 46. Read through this. It is about the secret convert from within the household of Fir'aun. وَقَالَ رَجْلٌ مُؤْمِنٌ مِّنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنَ يَكْتُمُ إِيمَانَهُ So a man 
who was a mu'min from the family of Fir'aun who concealed his iman. So this is a story about the ally. Some have said this is the person who, when he says Surah Al-Qasas, a man came from the far part of the town saying, Oh Musa, flee, they're about to kill you. Some say it is that man and some say it was another man. The point being that the surah mentions a secret convert in the family of Fir'aun. Some scholars have said it was a cousin. Some have even said it was another son of Fir'aun from another wife, an actual son of Fir'aun. And this story mentions how he tried to protect Musa in his own way and how he tried to give da'wah to the elite people from within the palace. And this story has many, many benefits. Of them is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help this religion from sources that you least expected. Right in the household of the enemy, right amongst the blood relatives of the Fir'aun, there was a convert, subhanAllah. And there was an ally for Musa from the very family that was killing the Bani Israel. Never give up hope uh, of Iman from people whom you deem to be unrighteous. Look at what happened to Umar bin Khattab. Look at Hamza radiallahu an and how he gave Izzah to Islam at his conversion. Never give up hope. Allah Azza wa Jal will find allies for this religion from all places. Of the benefits as well of the story is that it is allowed for a person who converts in a hostile environment to conceal his or her faith. And there are so many people around the world today and I know that some of you watching this program themselves, I've gotten emails from them and we see this on Twitter and whatnot, that there are secret converts living in societies that are persecuting Muslims. Our hearts go out to them. But my dear brother and sister, you are not alone. You have the company of great people like the Negus, the, the emperor of Abyssinia, like as well the Mu'min of Ali Fir'aun. There were many great men. And of course, we will not know the majority of them because they are secret, but Allah Azza wa Jal knows. So realize that it is allowed to conceal your faith if you live in a society or you're circumstances are such that you will be physically harmed or persecuted and you don't have anywhere else to go, then it is forgiven. Turn to Allah, do whatever you can uh, that will protect you and Whatever you cannot do, inshaAllah ta'ala, you are forgiven if, if you're forced to uh, do that. Also, we learn from this uh, surah, uh, from the Mu'min of Ali Fir'aun, is that uh, he preached in a very, very wise manner, in a very indirect manner, because he did not uh, you know, come out and say, I'm a believer in, in uh, Musa. Rather, he has to pretend he's with the, the people of Fir'aun. And so the language that he uses is a language that if he were an open Muslim, for example, he, some, some of the more overzealous would have found it problematic. So for, for example, in verse 28, uh, he says that, uh, are you going to kill a person simply because he says his God is, is Allah? And you know, he has brought, وَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ بِالْبَيْنَاتِ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ He has brought some evidence. فَإِنْ يَكُوْ كَاذِبًا فَعَلَيْهِ كَذِبُهُ If he is a liar, then the lie will be against him. But if he is truthful, then what if what he is saying actually happens? Now, subhanAllah. To accuse the Prophet of lying is not something that yani, a Muslim really does, you know. But he's not actually accusing him of lying. He's saying he might be a liar. He might be telling the truth. What if he's a liar? Well, then he, his lie is against him. But what if he is telling the truth? My point here is as follows. This phrasing, we cannot imagine a, a Muslim in normal circumstances uttering this phrase. Yet the mu'min of Ali Fir'aun has to say this because the society, the people, the pressure, he needs to balance a very delicate you know, line between still being a part of the system that he's in and at the same time trying to push that help. And this is something that Again, this is one of those awkward issues. I, I wish we had more time to go into those infamous tangents of mine, but again, we can't go there. But I, I need you to understand this point here. And that is that this is what you call wisdom. We need the mu'min of Ali Fir'aun to speak in that language. Now, in our times, the problem comes, and unfortunately, social media and YouTube and Twitter does have this problem that anybody, anybody with zero credentials can have access to the entire globe. And so imagine one of these, you know, uh, uh, youngsters with this overzealousness, this type of phrasing, immediately they would say, oh my God, this guy's a sellout. This guy is pretending, a'udhu billah, that he's saying that the Prophet might be a liar. And again, their harshness and rashness and brashness and naivety and neophyte, all of this comes in together. And again, you have those innocent people, they're like, oh, you know, that kid has a point. Why didn't the moment of Ali Fir'aun be blunt and straight and speak the haqq and whatnot? But see, this is where wisdom is different from 
you know, infantile, uh, you know, lack of wisdom, let's just call it. It really is an overzealousness that doesn't have uh, any sense of reality. The mu'min of Ali Fir'aun had to speak in that language and it was effective. He managed to, you know, create a safe space for certain things to be done. If that wasn't there, if he were to be as blunt as some of the youngsters might have wanted him to be, he would not have gotten there. And again, this shows us that people work in different ways and people with different statuses, different, um, uh, different different niches, different audiences. They have to have their own ways of preaching the truth. And we need to understand that there are plenty of mu'mins of Ali Fir'aun in all types of lands and places. And they have to speak and preach in ways that, you know, they're not, the, it's not a lie what he said. We're never allowed to lie ever about our faith unless we are physically being forced to, to you know, uh, torture. But otherwise, what he is saying is technically true. He might be a liar, in which case the lies against him. But what if he's telling the truth? And so we have to be cognizant of what really wisdom is. Bottom line, don't listen to people that don't have much experience and wisdom, even if their tongues sound eloquent. Follow those that are genuinely people of knowledge and people that have a track record of, uh, of wisdom. And may Allah Azza wa Jalla make all of us amongst them. Uh, another point we can benefit from this um, uh, story is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect those who believe and turn to Him. That Allah says in the Quran, verse 45, So Allah protected him from all of the evil designs that they had against him, their evil scheming. And so those who put their faith, faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they shall be protected by Allah. Uh, the story then goes on to uh, describe some conversations between the people of Jahannam. It is as if this argumentation happening in the palace between the viziers of Fir'aun and the people of Fir'aun, that they will continue, of course, minus the person who was saved, and all of that arguing will take place, that who is the worst and whose fault was it all? And again, the Quran always mentions this bickering, and we don't want to be amongst those people that will be bickering in this world or in the uh, hereafter. And then the surah uh, concludes with a very clear warning. Verse 83, that when their messengers came to them with clear proofs, فَرِحُوا بِمَا عِنْدَهُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ They rejoiced with the knowledge that they thought they had, and they used that knowledge to ridicule what the messengers came with. SubhanAllah. This is a very scary verse, that the knowledge that we have, if it is not in conformity with what the messengers come with, that knowledge has the potential to misguide us. We have to assess our knowledge. If we are believers, we have to assess our paradigm, we have to assess our values, our morality, our ethics, our whatever we think to be right and wrong. The ultimate criterion is what comes from the messengers. That is where guidance lies. Otherwise, every society thinks that it is rightly guided and every society has its own version of guidance. And we are born in a particular time, particular place, absorbing certain values. And this is one of the biggest problems we see in our times as well. Over and over again, the clash between what we think should be right and wrong versus what the Quran comes with. With. Notice this verse here, that when the messengers came to them, they thought that their knowledge was better than the knowledge of the messengers. Subhanallah, subhanallah. What knowledge can be more authentic than the knowledge of Alimul Ghaybi wa Shahada? The knowledge that is coming from the creator of the heavens and the earth. Don't be amongst those people. Don't use any misguided knowledge you have to oppose the knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah. The final verse we'll do today is Surah Fussilat, and it is a mid-size surah, five and a half, six pages. It is a Makki surah, as we said, all of these are Makki surahs, and it is 54 verses. And Fussilat means that which is perfectly explained. And one of the main themes of the surah is to talk about the Quran. And the term Fussilat is used multiple times, twice in the surah, to describe the Quran. That the Quran is Fussilat, which means perfectly explained. Everything explains uh, uh, everything else in the Quran. And one of the main themes of the surah is to discuss the Quran and the message of the Quran and the fate of those who rejected this message. It is said that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited Surah Fussilat uh, to one of the Quraysh who wanted to negotiate with him and offered him a bribe and said, do whatever, we'll give you this, we'll give you that. And if you just give up your religion. So the Prophet ﷺ recited Surah Fussilat and uh, the Qurashi became very flustered and very agitated. And he realized that this is not something that, uh, you know, uh, he is dealing with that is, that is, that is uh, from this world. It is something that is divine. And he rushed back to the, uh, to the um, famous uh, Nadi or the famous council of the uh, people of the Quraysh. And the Quraysh saw him and said, this person that is coming back, he doesn't seem to be the same person that has left the impact of Surah Fussilat on that leader from the Quraysh. Uh, Surah Fussilat begins 
by describing the Quran and those who rejected verses one to eight. And then Allah Azza wa mentions how he created the creation in the stages of the creation verses nine to 12. And Allah Azza wa mentions that he told the heavens and the earth to cleft asunder and to come together. And they uh, obeyed the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes a scene from the day of judgment. And even though the scene is meant for the enemies of Allah, still we should be careful that no portion of it applies to us. Verse 19, on that day, the enemies of Allah will be herded into the fire of hell until when they have reached it, their eyes and their ears and their skins will all testify against them what they used to do. And then they will say after all of this to their own skins, why did you testify against us? The skins will respond to them that Allah Azza wa Jal who made all things speak, He made us speak as well. And then Allah says, you never ever thought to hide yourself from your own skins, your own hearing, your own seeing. You never thought that those entities of your, yours would bear witness against you. And you assume that Allah Azza wa Jal was unaware of much of what you do. We don't want to be like this, even though the verse primarily applies to the enemies of Allah, but still we don't want our skins to testify against us, our eyes to testify against Against us, we should try to utilize all of the blessings of Allah for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, Surah Fussilat is really um, well known for uh, a section that is commonly recited in the salawat as well, verses 30 to 38, which ends in a prostration and it gives glad tidings to the believers. <inaudible> Those who say Allah is our Lord and then they remain firm in that. The angels will descend upon them in ranks and ranks. Our Prophet said this is at the time of death. When the person is about to die, he will see angels everywhere. And the angels will say, Allah takhafu wa la tahzanu. Don't be scared about what you're about to face. And don't worry about your family that you're leaving behind. Nahnu awliya'ukum. We are your allies and protectors. We took care of you throughout and we will take care of you as well uh, uh, on and on. Nuzula min ghafoor rahim This is a hospitality that Allah Azza wa Jal, the Ghafoor and the Rahim is uh, giving to you. And then Allah says, who does a better job? Woman ahsanu qawlan. Who does something better than the one who calls to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he himself does good deeds and acts with integrity. And he says, I am from those who submit to Allah. We want to be in that category. We want when we're about to die, the angels to surround us of beautiful faces so that we feel comfort. We don't feel terror. We want to be welcomed by these armies of beautiful angels that will tell us, don't worry, don't fear. We're gonna protect you. We'll take care of you and we'll take care of your family as well. And they will take us up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we get there? The one who calls to the way of Allah and who acts with integrity and who says, I am from the Muslimin. And then Allah says, Good and evil are never the same. Repel evil with good. And you shall see that the person who was your worst enemy will become your best friend. But none will attain that level except those who persevere and are firm and none will attain that level except those who are very fortunate. And Allah Azza wa Jal tells us here, good and evil are never the same. Always dear Muslim, always in any situation, try to be the better of the two for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the goal that we have. And if you're able to repel some bad manners, some you know slur, some negativity with a positive, try your best to do that. Even if you think you're gonna lose that one incident, in the long run, you shall be the winner. And in the long run, it is that person who will be the one who is successful. And again, uh, this is the general rule. And I've given other lectures about sometimes you do have to respond in, in kindness and it is allowed to do that. But the general rule is that you try your best to return an evil with good. If somebody says something vulgar, something nasty, you just smile and say, may Allah Azza wa guide me and you to that which is best. Simple as that, general, you know, something nice to do. And perhaps, perhaps if you return that nastiness with a good comment, if you do something positive, perhaps your worst enemy will realize, you know what, I was really being a bad person and I should, you know, uh, repent and, and turn over a new and this is something that those who have tried this, they know it actually works. And of course it is going to work. <coughs> because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that it is going to work. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verse 36, that if any temptation comes from the shaitan, 
then seek refuge in Allah. Anytime your anger is boiling, anytime you want to do something that you should not be doing, instead of acting upon it, say, A'udhu Billahi min shaytan rajim because anger is one of the tactics of shaitan, especially when you're having some type of back and forth, your blood is just about to boil. Look, you need to turn to Allah and turning to Allah will calm you down. So Allah Azza wa is saying in these types of situations, again, the dhikr of Allah is always of paramount importance. And the surah then returns to describing the Quran. The concluding passage is a very beautiful passage, verses 45 onwards, that Allah Azza wa mentions uh, that this is a book that لا يأتيه الباطل من بين Batil, falsehood, evil, cannot even approach the Quran, neither from before it or behind it. From no direction can evil approach the Quran. It is indeed a tanzeel, a revelation from the one who is Aziz, the one who is all powerful, the one who is all mighty. And in this section as well, Allah says, if we had given the Quran, to you, an Arab prophet, in a language that was not Arabic, they would have said, what is this? An Arabic prophet with a non-Arabic book, a Arabiyun wa ajami. This is in the Quran here that the reason why the Quran is in Arabic is because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is an Arab, and of course the language has to be Arabic. And some uh, people ask that why is the Quran in Arabic? Why not in another language? And the reality is that if it had been in any other language, all other people would have asked the same question. It had to have been in some language, and Allah azza wa jalla chose the best language. And if you uh, study the intricacies of Arabic and you study how Arabic works and the issues of morphology and sarf, yani nahu and sarf and balagha, you will understand, and this is something that is well known, that Arabic is indeed uh, the most, not one of the most, it is the most eloquent language on earth. And Allah Azza wa Jal chose Arabic for this reason. No other language can do what Arabic uh, does. The language branch of Arabic, which is the Semitic languages, it is a very unique branch which, ha which has tools within it that no other language has, and that's definitely beyond the scope of, of this uh, lecture. But the point is that I wanted to uh, make this point before I conclude that it is understandable that us who are non-Arabs, and I am a non-Arab as well, that uh, we do find impediments to fully appreciate the Quran because of our own upbringing. We weren't taught Arabic. Two points here, first and foremost, you will still understand and appreciate some beauty of the Quran even if you go through a translation and even if you listen to the Arabic, that is enough for you to inshallah ta'ala be a good Muslim and enter Jannah. But no doubt, if you wanted to go advanced and you wanted to study or you wanted to appreciate the Quran in its original, then you do need to study the Arabic language. But that is again for those who want to dedicate uh, themselves. And uh, in the end of the day, Allah chose the language that was the best. And uh, as I said, if you study uh, the intricacies of Arabic, you will begin to understand no language would ever have been able Able to do uh, what uh, the, the Arabic of the Quran is able to do. And so Allah chose the best language for the best prophet, for the best time and place. And that is why Allah says that it is a Quran and Arabian, غير ذي عوج. It is a pure Arabic Quran. And Allah says, we gave this Quran to you in Arabic so that they can understand. And Allah says the Prophet is an Arab and he was given an Arabic Quran. If he were to be given a non-Arabic Quran, that would have been nonsensical. Arabiyun wa ajami. And then the surah concludes verse 53 and 54, We will continue to show them signs. The miracles are going to be everywhere for them, all around them in the heavens and even in their souls. The miracles are always there. The miracle of the existence of Allah, the miracles that prove that Allah is one, the miracles that prove that Allah Azza wa is our creator, and the miracle that proves that the Prophet is the Prophet, that's the Quran. So the miracles of creation will always be there, and the miracle of the Quran will always be there. So any anyone who wants the truth, there are too many miracles for them to look around. And Allah says, we will continue to show them these miracles of our proofs all around them. And even within themselves, they will realize until those who want to know will find the truth. Isn't it sufficient that indeed Allah Azza wa is a witness over all matters and things. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make sure that we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to ensure that the Quran remains a guidance for us until we die. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to be of those righteous worshippers whose hearts and whose chests 
are open to the religion of Islam and who are guided by the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whose hearts soften at the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for those that are watching live, remember tonight is an odd night. So do some extra actions of worship. May Allah azza wa jal make us of those who are standing on Laylatul Qadr. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وحملته في فلكك المشحول يا من أحال النار حول خليله روحا وريحانا بطولك كون